Hi, everyone. I'm Annalie Brinks. I'm an associate professor up the road a piece at Michigan State University. And I'm listed as a visiting scholar at the D3 Center. What it doesn't tell you is I've been here for seven years, <laughs> a really long visitor. <laughs> but um, I love it here, and I'm so glad to be here. And I get to present what I think is the best module of Katie, which is to give you um, a whole breadth of ideas for what your smarts could look like. And they can take lots of different shapes and flavors, and we've seen a couple already. Um, but there's a whole world of smart designs out there. So my job in the next hour is to sort of get your juices flowing about the types of smarts that could exist in your world. Um, and so we have four case, uh, smart case studies that I'm going to walk you through. They're all real studies. They've all been published. The references for them are at the end of my slide deck, but they're also in the reference list for Katie. So if you get curious about any of them, um, go read the papers. I like to point out that I've had nothing to do with any of these smarts. <laughs> so I'm here as a facilitator. Um, but there are lots of people in the room who have been deeply involved in some of these smarts. So if you have questions that are sort of in the weeds about the trial or the science behind the trial, um, we can connect you to folks that can help answer those questions. So we'll talk about the four smarts, and then we'll talk about sort of how they compare on a number of different dimensions and sort of where the commonalities are and where they differ from one another. So the first smart that we're going to talk about is called extend. And I should also add that only one of these is in education. Um, we're not worried about that. Our goal is to give you sort of a broad spectrum of smarts, and um, they happen to come from a wide range of disciplines. So the first two are in substance use, the third is in weight loss, and the fourth is in education. So EXTEND is a, um, is a trial that was done by David Oslin. And the population of interest here are alcohol-dependent adults who are participating in what we call an IOP, an intensive outpatient program. So this is a drug treatment program where they go during the day, and then they go back home at night. So they're not staying. And I'm going to. In these first slides, I'm going to talk about the population and then the outcome, and then we'll go back to the rationale. So the outcome that we're interested in here is reducing the, the drinking behavior of these adults. Right? So the rationale for this trial is based on naltrexone, which is a, um, it's a medication. And the goal of naltrexone is sort of to reduce the physiological good feelings that come with alcohol use. So um, naltrexone is pretty efficacious. But about a third of our patients relapse when they're on it. So it doesn't work for everyone. And we need strategies for those for whom it doesn't work. So we need strategies for our non-responders. But this team also wanted to talk about or figure out what, what kinds of maintenance strategies were best, even for people for whom naltrexone seems to be working. So we call them our responders. And the reasons for relapse on naltrexone are sort of multi-component, right? Some of them are physiological, but there are also social reasons for relapse and psychological reasons for relapse. So we want to kind of bake those in to some of the intervention components as well. So EXTEND uh, has three scientific questions that we're going to focus on. The first is an interesting one because it's really about our tailoring variable. So what measures of drinking behavior best reflects non-response to naltrexone. That's not something we've seen yet as an example. So this is kind of a fun example to look at. The second research question is about those non-responders. What's the best intervention strategy for those folks? And the third research question is about the individuals for whom naltrexone is working. What's the best way to continue um, offering support to them? What do they need? So the SMART for EXTEND begins with a randomization at treatment outset to naltrexone. Everybody gets naltrexone. But some are randomized to naltrexone with a lenient definition of non-response. And some are randomized to naltrexone with a stringent definition of non-response. And we'll talk about the, the tailoring variable a little bit more in a couple slides. But just to give you sort of a preview, the lenient definition of non-response allows for five or more heavy drinking days in one week. So that's quite a few heavy drinking days, right? But the stringent definition is two or more. 
So we're talking about randomizing here, not to two different stage one interventions, everybody gets naltrexone, but we're randomizing to two different definitions of non-response. Um, in this trial, uh, participants were assessed weekly to, uh, on, that, on that tailoring variable. And as soon as they trigger non-response, whichever definition they're in, they're re-randomized to either switching to a combined behavioral intervention that addresses things like adherence. It might involve social, you know, community members, family members, and some of those psychological barriers that we talked about as reasons for relapse. Or they were randomized to continue with naltrexone and add the combined behavioral intervention. So notice there's two strategies there for non-responders, switching to the behavioral intervention or augmenting naltrexone with the behavioral intervention. See that? And I believe that can happen at any one of those eight weeks. That's right. It's remarkable. Yeah, so it's like a, a window. So if, oh, go sorry, ahead. I have a quick question. Yeah. When it, if it, things can happen during any one of those eight weeks, how do you like, are those other sub questions to look at in the future? Like, how do you look at Because some people are getting longer yes. in stage two. Yeah, you could look the at that later. The optimization criteria here is they want to develop a very good 24 week intervention. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If at all of those eight week assessments, those participants never trigger non-response, whatever their definition they were assigned to, then they're considered responders. And remember, our third scientific question was about how do we, you know, how do we provide ongoing maintenance for those folks? And so here, the strategies are to either continue with naltrexone or to continue with naltrexone but add telephone disease management, which is a phone-based sort of minimal clinical support but still kind of a human component to what's going on. Okay. So if we take this, I, I can't figure out which screen to look at. <laughs> if we take the scientific questions and lay them next to, you know, put them sort of alongside our SMART, we can see that for every scientific question that we have, we have a randomization. So that first scientific question is about uh, the lenient versus the stringent definition of non-response, and we have a randomization at stage one. Just gonna address that. The second and third uh, questions are about what to do for non-responders and what to do for responders, and we have randomizations at both of those, for both of those groups as well. Okay. In terms of intervention options, we've talked about these a little bit already. In the first stage, everybody gets the same thing, which is naltrexone. In the second stage, responders have sort of two tactics that they might be randomized to. Uh, I'm sorry, non-responders, they might switch to the cognitive behavioral, uh, the uh, combined behavioral intervention, or they might augment naltrexone, so continue taking naltrexone, but add the CBI. And for responders, those strategies are either to continue with the naltrexone alone, or to continue with the naltrexone and add telephone disease management. Okay. The tailoring variable here um, is a response, non-response, right? So two dimensions. And like we said earlier, it's based on these weekly assessments. So rather than it being a sort of fixed time point, one time point, it's eight time points. So weekly assessment. And it's based on self-reported drinking days in that week's period. And that definition does differ for men and women, right? So for men, a heavy drinking day is more than five drinks a day. And for women, it's more than four. And, um, and then, of course, we talked about that that tailoring variable differs depending on what they were randomized to in stage one, either the lenient definition or the stringent definition. So Danny talked earlier about how SMARTs have embedded within them multiple interventions, some of which are adaptive, some of which are non-adaptive. In this SMART, because everyone is re-randomized, there are eight embedded interventions and they uh, all look, they look like this. So the first begins with naltrexone and a lenient definition of non-response. Responders continue with naltrexone. Non-responders switch to the CBI. The second begins the same way. Responders continue with naltrexone. Non-responders 
continue with naltrexone but add the CBI, so an augment tactic. The third begins the same way. <laughs> Responders uh, have naltrexone plus telephone disease management, and non-responders have, they switch to the CBI. And the fourth begins with the lenient definition. Uh, responders uh, continue with naltrexone, add dis telephone disease management, and non-responders continue with naltrexone and add the combined behavioral intervention. And so that's four, right? And then there are four more that look exactly the same, but begin with the stringent definition of non-response rather than the, the lenient definition. Okay. So this study's primary aim was a type two, and it's all about non-responders. So among non-responders, they wanted to compare the augmentation tactic, naltrexone plus the CBI, versus the switch tactic, stopping naltrexone and switching to CBI, looking at the long-term outcome of percent days abst abstinent during the study. So this trial would have been powered on the combination of C and G compared to the combination of D, D and H in terms of those long-term outcomes. Secondary aims included a type one aim, which is that question about which tailoring variable is better. Uh, another, uh, another type two aim, which is the effect of telephone disease management for responders compared to not adding that human component. And then uh, type fours, um, which we haven't talked a lot about, but moderators, so baseline moderators of any of the treatment components that are embedded. Okay, questions about extent? I just want to say, to date, that, first of all, that's the first SMART ever conducted, and to date, it may well be the most novel one. I just want you all to know, so anybody that was sleeping, or not paying attention. <laughs> I, I need you to like go back and take a look at what Emily just presented because this idea that there's a tailoring variable that's dynamic, it can be triggered at in any one of stages, is novel. The idea that they randomized to two different definitions of the tailoring variable mm -hmm. is novel. I mean, the novelty here is bananas. Yeah. I just want y'all to realize that. Yeah. Okay? This is not a run of the mill trial. This yeah, like, my favorite thing about this trial is that they randomized to the tailoring variable because that's such a question that, like, we kind of guess sometimes about what the best tailoring variable, and this one actually tests the best tailoring variable, which is lovely. All right, so our second uh, smart case study is uh, RBT, which is a treatment program for pregnant women who are drug dependent. So we have a very high risk population. Um, Andre Jones was the PI on this one. And the population are pregnant women who are using opioids or cocaine. So high-risk behavior in a high-risk population, we really need something pretty powerful to work with um, in terms of intervention for these, for these pregnant people. The outcome of interest was completing the treatment program um, up through the end of pregnancy. So baby delivered is the end of pregnancy. Um, and, and as well as looking at substance use um, and session attendance. So adherence was an issue as well. RBT stands for reinforcement-based treatment. It's an efficacious intervention that is extremely costly to administer and extremely high burden for participants. It's, it's a really a wraparound program, provides all kinds of intervention components for the pregnant people, um, and it works, but it's expensive and burdensome to deliver. And about 40% of the participants don't have the outcomes that uh, don't respond quite as well as would be hoped for. And so in addition to that, um, so we've got a, a burden issue, a cost issue. Um, it's not working for everybody, so we have a heterogeneity issue in terms of intervention effectiveness. And then there's a compliance issue in terms of getting um, the pregnant people to stick around for the program, which is why one of the outcomes is about treatment completion, right? So making sure that they stay with it. So the scientific questions here that we're going to focus on um, are looking at, I love this trial too, because it takes RBT, which is this big sort of multi-component intervention, and it tries to assess whether we can break it down into smaller pieces that are less expensive to deliver and less burdensome for the participant, but still have the outcomes that we're after. And so there's um, sort of treatment as usual RBT, but then there's a super duper RBT that we call enhanced. So you'll see ERBT in my slides. But then there are two versions, a reduced version 
and an abbreviated version that are step downs of the treatment as usual. So we've got sort of the spectrum of versions of RBT that we're going to look at. So one of the scientific questions is, can the traditional version of RBT be reduced in the intensity and the scope without you know, affecting the outcomes too much? The second is, should the pregnant person who does not re respond quickly continue with that version that they're in, whatever that might be, or should they be stepped up to something more intensive and larger scope? And if the pregnant person is doing well, should they stay where they are, or can we back off a little bit in terms of the intensity and scope, reduce the burden, and still see the same outcomes? Okay. So this is the RBT trial. It begins with a randomization to two versions of RBT. The little t RBT is treatment as usual RBT, so that's the standard package. And the little r is the reduced version of RBT. So we've stepped down the scope and intensity a little bit, reduced the cost a little bit, reduced the burden a little bit. And then at week two, week two, that's pretty early, right? That's very early in an intervention, but we're talking about a very high risk population engaged in very high risk behaviors who often are on their way out the door in terms of intervention by week two. So by week two, we're assessing how they're doing. And we'll talk about the tailoring variable, um, but they're classified as either early compliers or early non-compliers. Everyone is re-randomized in this SMART. Those who at week two are early compliers either continue with where they started. So if they started with reduced, they continue with reduced. If they started with treatment as usual, they continue with treatment as usual or they step down. So if they started with reduced, they step down to abbreviated. If they started with treatment as usual, they step down to reduced. So there's a lot of letters on there right now, right? But if you think about that second stage as a strategy, the strategy for responders, for early compliers, is to either stay the course or to step down. And similarly, for those who are, are identified as early non-compliant, the strategy is either to stay the course with whatever they began with or to step up the intensity. So if they started in treatment as usual, they step up to enhanced. If they started in reduced, they step up to treatment as usual. Make sense? So this, this, adapt this SMART is trying to figure out how to build an adaptive intervention that sort of modulates the intensity and scope based on how participants are experiencing the intervention, how they're complying with it, and whether it's working for them. So again, we'll put the scientific questions on the left there, the study design on the right, and you can see that the first randomization is addressing that first question, traditional versus reduced. The second is addressing the, the, uh, the randomization of the um, non-responders is addressing that second question, and the randomization of the responders is addressing that third question. So again, um, like Extend, we have a, a study design here where everyone experiences a randomization two times. The intervention options we've talked about already. So in the first stage, it's either the, the traditional package, the treatment as usual package of RBT, or the slightly reduced version. In the second stage, for non-responders, we're either going to step them up or continue with where they are. And for the second stage responders, they're either going to step down or continue where they are. The tailoring variable in this study is also a favorite of mine because it's a nice combination of whether the intervention is working and whether the pregnant person is adhering to it. And these are two different things, right? I can go to every treatment session that is offered to me, and the intervention might not work for me. And so I still might be using drugs. But I, I also might not attend any of the sessions. And that's a different reason why the intervention might not be working. So this uh, tailoring variable is based on three things. And any of them can trigger uh, non-compliance uh, classification. They can be non-compliant if they missed an intervention day without contacting their um, facilitator or their counselor to let them know 
or if they have a positive drug test on a urine specimen, or if they self-report drug use. So three ways that non-compliance can be um, triggered in this study, and any of those might do it. Okay. Anneli, can I chime in? Yes. I, I, this is just gorgeous, and I want everybody to appreciate the beauty. Y'all, Jim, do you see how real world this is? Like, you are right out of the gates non-compliant if you just don't show up. This is real world, y'all. And in substance use, that's going to happen quite a bit. You're not going to show up. You're going to disappear. Poof. But then if you do show up, meaning you showed up and you told me about your drug use, then now I have two ways, right? Yeah? You're positive on opiate or cocaine, or you self-reported you know, you self use of either drug. That, this is incredible, y'all, these three little lines right here about how real world they are, y'all. Yeah. Take a look at that, OK? Because um, you know, if you don't provide the urine drug screen, because you don't want to, but you tell me you did, you're non-compliant. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you don't tell me, you're non-compliant. Like, we're not leaving anything to chance here. That's gorgeous. Yeah. And it's at week two. So they're capturing that yeah. very early intervention. Oh, wait. Intervention. I want to speak to that. Rona. Yeah. Where's Rona? Rona, one of the things you're coming up against is you don't yet understand the dynamics of identity exploration. This study understood the dynamics of pregnant women in treatment. Why do I say that? This study knew that at week three, if a pregnant woman doesn't show up, I'm never going to find her. That's why they put the tailoring verb at week two. Y'all see that? It doesn't get more real world than this. Andre, An Andre, Andres, um, OK, this dovetails with your project. Because in your project, I asked you this question, are there any other pathways to get to your outcome? There is no other pathway other than RBT when this study was written. For pregnant women that are cocaine users or opioid users, there is no other intervention in the world other than RBT. So it was justifiable for them to think only about RBT. Do you all see how all these stars are colliding? Even your own projects are rearing their heads here. Do you all see what's going on here? But Andres, they had a solid argument to make that case. RBT is the only game in town, but it's too expensive. I need to figure out a way. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't just like they woke up one morning and they only wanted to focus on RBT. You know what I mean? Can I do a clarifying question? So I, this is a great example of why two weeks is important and you have the knowledge to do that. That's right. Can you clarify that like, if I am non-compliant prior to week two, when does my intervention change? At week two. In this study, it's one time point. Yeah. Okay. It's only yeah. actually, yeah, at week two is when they're collecting this tailoring variable. That's it. Mm -hmm. Notice how wildly different this was from Extend that did it every single week. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys should be getting goosebumps about the novelty that's rearing its head here. It's bananas. It's completely bananas. OK, so in this study, everybody's re-randomized. We again have eight embedded interventions, but only six of them are adaptive. And this is another feature of this study that I absolutely love. So let's look at the first one. Start with reduced RBT. Early compliers step down to abbreviate it. Early non-compliers continue with RBT. That's an adaptive intervention, right? Compliance status determines what happens next, and what happens next is different depending on your compliance status. Second intervention, begin with reduced RBT. Compliers step down to abbreviate it. Non-complier, early non-compliers step up to treatment as usual. Another adaptive intervention. But look at this one. We begin with reduced RBT, just as before. Early compliers continue with reduced RBT. Early non-compliers also continue with reduced RBT. This is not an adaptive intervention, right? Complier status has no play here, other than we collected it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's part of the intervention in terms of it being collected. But it's not determining uh, really what happens in stage two, because what happens in stage two is the same for everyone, regardless of their compliance status. So this is a sort of a fixed, a fixed intervention that's embedded within this SMART. 
and it's a fixed intervention of reduced RBT, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. One more adaptive intervention at the top here, begin with reduced RBT, early compliant, stay with reduced RBT, early non-compliant, step up to treatment as usual. And then there are four of the same at the bottom, but beginning with treatment as usual. And that first one that's highlighted is again, a non-adaptive intervention that's embedded within this SMART that begins with treatment as usual, continues with treatment as usual for early compliers, and continues with treatment as usual for early non-compliers. So again, a, a non-adaptive fixed intervention within the SMART. And that one, e.g., the non-adaptive, always traditional RBT, is the one they had the most evidence about before they launched this study. Because the only studies prior to this one were about traditional RBT, but they had all these issues with it. But notice it's in there. That's beautiful because what they're doing is they're saying, this is in here, it's anchoring us, but I really want to figure out how to send with these women down different paths. Yeah. It's just so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. We can't afford to continue to offer this yeah. for everyone. This one is not actually affordable. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. All right. So the primary aim for this study was a type one, but look at this type one. It's a comparison of the two non-adaptive interventions that are embedded in the SMART. So it's comparing always reduced RBT for everybody all the time, every stage, to always treatment as usual RBT for everybody all the time. Kind of cool. Wait, so coming back to an earlier yeah. conversation with Matt, right, Matt <laughs> yeah. Hirschberg, the thing they wanted to provide the most assurances about, that is the 220 sample size, had nothing to do with adaptation. Their primary aim, the thing they're providing the most assurances about was, do I do the traditional thing, which I know has a bunch of problems, or can I get away with reduced? And yet, they're still gonna answer all the other questions. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So their secondary aims are about moderators, those type four questions, um, and then whether there might be other variables that they could use to tailor treatment so that uh, you know, the more deeply tailoring um, that I forget if Billy or Danny talked about it this morning, but somebody did. Okay. All right, you ready for the third? So the third trial uh, is a SMART weight loss trial. So we've left the world of, of substance use. We're now in the world of weight loss. Uh, and it's all about integrating M health, mobile health, into obesity treatment. And our own Billy, who has left the room, was a PI on this study. She's here. She's Why? here. She's here. I don't see her. I'm just hiding. <laughs> so Billy uh, is in, in the house. If you have questions about the study, this is an awesome study. Uh, the focus, the population here are adults with obesity or overweight. And the outcome of interest was about weight change over the six month time period. So from baseline to six months. And the rationale here, um, it, some of these rationales are gonna start to sound similar, right? So the, we have efficacious weight loss interventions and they're costly and they're burdensome and they, they can be um, difficult to deliver for those two reasons. But we also have M Health tools, mobile health tools, right? Apps on our phones that are efficacious but, and scalable, so they're and inexpensive, um, but there's high heterogeneity in how well they work for everyone they, uh, individuals often require more than just an app to be successful with, um, with weight loss goals. And there's lots of open questions still even now about how to best integrate mobile health into existing tools uh, for weight loss uh, prevention, uh, promotion. So, you know, how do we take the expensive components and kind of work in the mobile health components and combine them in ways that reduce costs but uh, increase effectiveness? So the two scientific questions that we'll focus on here um, are, again, kind of novel in the way they're phrased. So the first is about um, whether the app alone, the mobile health component, is non-inferior to the app plus coaching as an initial intervention you know, in, the, in the course of an adaptive intervention. So this is a different way to phrase a scientific question, right? We're not saying, is app plus coaching better than the app alone? we're saying, are they essentially about the same? And if they're essentially about the same, maybe we can go the less expensive, less burdensome route, right? The second here is, what's the best augmentation tactic for non-responders? 
Um, is it better to, is it okay to add another mobile health component like texting, which is the example in this study? Or do we need to add another mobile health component, but also one of the traditional, more expensive um, components that are in our toolkits, which could be meal replacement, that's the MR, where meals are delivered to your door, or coaching, where you have an individual to work you know, one on one with. So this study uh, begins with a randomization to either the app alone or the app plus a coach. And the tailoring variable here is assessed at week two, at week four, and at week eight. So it's kind of like extend, except it's three times instead of eight times, right? But sort of three opportunities to assess that tailoring variable. We'll talk about that, what that tailoring variable is in a couple slides, but we have responders and non-responders. Responders are individuals for whom whatever they were assigned to seems to be working fine. So we're gonna leave them alone. We're gonna let them continue doing what they were doing. Non-responders um, are gonna be re-randomized to either add another mHealth component, which is text messaging, or add text messaging plus one of the traditional components. And for those who began with the app, this is gonna be adding text messaging plus coaching because they haven't had coaching yet. For those who started with the app plus coaching, this is gonna be adding text messaging plus meal replacement. So if you look at experimental condition F, this is sort of the, the platinum package, right? They're getting app plus coaching out the gate, then we're gonna add texting, then we're gonna add meal replacement. They've got all the tools that we have at our availability. And again, you can see the scientific questions on the left, the study design on the right. That first randomization aligns with our first study question, which is, is the app alone? non-inferior to the app plus coaching as an initial stage one intervention. And the second randomization aligns with our second research question about our non-responders. Notice in this SMART that not everyone experiences re-randomization, right? Some of our people, our responders, only get randomized one time at the beginning of the study, and then they're not randomized again. They continue. So only our non-responders have two randomizations. And I don't think we've said it yet, but I think it's in the um, videos. We often refer to this as sort of a prototypical SMART. This is a, a, a common SMART design that we see um, in the literature. Our intervention options in the first stage include the mobile health app alone or the mobile health app plus coaching. In the second stage, our non-responders either get a second mobile health intervention or a second mobile health intervention plus one of the traditional options, either meal replacement or coaching, if they haven't had coaching. And for responders, they just continue with what they began with. Do you have a question in the back here? Yep, go ahead. I have a question about um, just those responders, and I don't know if it needs to be specific to, you know, this, this um, study or just a hypothetical. If those responders were um, stop responding, <laughs> do they then go into a different, or would you lay, could you layer in another that you would check those responders and say, hmm, maybe I should, if I would have added something more, they would have lost more weight last year? Oh, that's interesting. So I think what you're talking about is, would you keep assessing the, res the, yes. the non-responders or the responders? Yeah, the responders. In this design, no, right? The, the assessment points are fixed, but I think you could certainly set up a SMART where you had a second set of assessment points and considered further tailoring. We tend to talk about two-stage SMARTs, but the sky's the limit in terms of the number of stages. Another way to frame that, and Billy's in the room, so she can yeah. chime in. Another way to frame that is, one of the things these scholars, Billy being one of them, already knew going into this study, was there's, it is not necessary to continue assessing for non-response beyond week eight. Either that, Billy can chime in, or they must have felt like that is the latest I can possibly assess in order for any 12-week program to have meal replacements or coaching have any, any sense practically. Either way, y'all, rest assured that if this design could have kept measuring response, it would have. 
So nothing here falls through the cracks, y'all. Everything has to be cogently argued for. So you don't read a design like this and then think, when you get the results back, then think, oh, I'm going to do assessments at week 10, 11, and 12. Uh -uh. That's not what this intervention is speaking to. This intervention is only speaking to doing assessments at 2, 4, and 8. That's it. But, but we actually did what you were proposing to do, but in a different way. Okay, so um, just combining what Danny and Emily said. What happened here is that I had data from Bonnie's uh, previous studies, and I analyzed it to see how soon I can identify non-responders, people who are highly likely to fail. And the data indicated that I can identify them at week two. So most weight loss interventions up to that point were only considering assessing, re assessing response status after uh, six to eight weeks. And then the data showed that by week two, I can actually tell you with really high probability who's going to fail. So if you did not lose half a pound on average over the past two weeks, you're going to fail 90% probability. So of course, we're going to classify you as a non-responder. But we did what you said because Bonnie pushed back on it. Bonnie said, look, Billy, it's too soon. I know the data shows this, but still, it's preliminary data. I want to continue assessing responders and see if they fail to lose the same amount of weight at week four and eight so that we can still catch them. Right? So if I was designing the study without Bonnie's input, I would have probably just randomized non-responders at week two, and that's about it, and stopped assessing responders at week two. But she said, no, you need to keep assessing responders just in case, right? And if you look at the results, which are about to be published in JAMA, Bonnie did the impossible very soon, you can see that most people got classified as non-responders at week two. Very few got classified as non-responders later, but still, some did get classified as non-responders later, meaning supporting what you just said, that sometimes it makes sense to continue assessing. Mm -hmm. The reason we didn't go beyond week eight is because self-monitoring is really burdensome. They had to get on a scale every morning to get the assessment, so we couldn't push it that far. We we're like, okay, by week eight, you know, they're highly likely to succeed anyway, let's just leave them alone, right? There's one more thing I want to say, which is cool, and it's not what you did, Billy, but I want to say it just to open their minds up. It could well be, it could have been that they were monitoring at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, and it could well be that that information that is triggering beyond week 8 was being used inside app and inside app coaching. In other words, these are just governing whether I'm triggering this. But these two interventions themselves might be adapted inside of them. Isn't that just mind boggling? Aren't you getting goosebumps? So, so like, what I'm trying to say, y'all, is it could be that app plus coaching itself, as an app plus coaching intervention, if it discovers that at week 10 you're falling out the cracks of the deep end, it does something. It just so happens it's under the auspices of app plus coaching. This definition of non-response was under the auspices or for the purposes of the texting and the meal replacements. You see what I'm saying? Try to open your brain up a little. And there's a big difference between using an app to monitor response status, which does not require effort from the participant and the clinician, and using weight loss as a tailoring variable, where you need to have an objective measure, and it's burdensome for both the patient and the clinician. ROC analysis. So we had longitudinal data from apps and from coaching sessions over six months. And we had an ultimate outcome that we defined as success or failure at month six. So it was weight loss, whether or not they lost 5% of their body weight by month six, which was clinically meaningful. And then I just played around with the data. I mean, this is purely, purely exploratory. I tried out app engagement by week one, weight loss by week one, app engagement by week two, weight loss by week two, and I kept going. 
up to a point where I found um, the point in time that optimized the area under the curve and gave me a threshold that clearly differentiated between people who are likely to fail versus succeed. Gave me 90% accuracy. So you, well, the sensitivity was 90%, the specificity was much lower. There's always a trade-off, but, but that's the, the kind of analysis that you do. It has advantages. In this case, we pretty much nailed it. Like the, when you see the results of the trial, the, it was exactly as we predicted in terms of the, the rate of responders and non-responders at each stage. But there are limitations to these, limitations to these analysis. Usually they're based on small samples, which is a problem. And you also don't have the subsequent treatment. So you are asking, in a sense, what variables and when can I predict ultimate failure? And this is how you identify non-responders. Yeah, exactly. It, that's the point, if they stay on the same treatment. And that's not necessarily the question of how do I identify non-responders when they actually get subsequent treatment. That's a different scientific question. Yeah. But, yeah. But I want to say one more thing, because this is also through the roof now, but we're only showing the case studies that are amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, the other thing I want to say, Billy, can you speak to, at two, at four, and at eight, are you using the same cutoff for weight loss? Yeah, I use the same cutoff. But yeah. did I have to? No, you didn't. The reason that we use the same cutoff is because I did not know any other, I didn't have any other cutoff that was better than this. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. And that's okay. Yeah. I think the reason I posed the question rhetorically is, is that I just want y'all to realize in a dynamic, you call it a dynamic yeah. variable, yeah. at the two, at the four, and at the eight, you don't have to be measuring the same yeah. cutoff. Mm -hmm. Just for y'all's sake. You can have something completely different. By the way, I'm not so sure that it actually made sense to use the same cutoff, but, but as I said, that's the best thing that we had at that time. If I had better data, maybe I would have found something that was much better. But yeah. And that's, again, a disadvantage of relying on observational data such as this one to identify the tailoring variable. But imagine you guys, and I look at Connie, you guys are in education sometimes have a lot of, um, you understand development very well, right? Development of psychology. And if you're, you know, if you're monitoring your little kid with autism, at, at you know, month six, month nine, and month 12, you might have different targets based on normative development. Yeah. And you might be putting the cutoff in different places, right? So it just depends what science you're bringing in, right? Right? Mm -hmm. I just want, we, our job is just to tell you what's possible. Yeah. There's <laughs> one last thing more. that I want to say about this trial, and I know, Emily, you need to <laughs> move forward, but <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to take, a, and I'm going to talk about micro and mice trials and hybrid designs, um, what you, want to know about this trial is that it wasn't just the smart, there was micro randomizations going on in the background throughout the study um, that was embedded in the app condition. So in the app, every day we randomize participants three times a day to different kinds of messaging to get them to self-monitor their dietary intake. Because self-monitoring dietary intake is a critical component in weight loss interventions, but people don't adhere to that, it's really hard to do. So you have apps that can facilitate that, but they're not so successful. So we were trying to change the messaging to randomize the messaging daily to increase the rate of um, self-monitoring. So just so you know, this is also possible. It's this crazy. study was really, really novel, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> considering the fact we designed it 10 years ago, just so you know. And uh, we were doing something that only now, I think we're beginning to understand. So Yeah, yeah there's like a cool. trial within a trial there. Yeah, yeah, yeah very cool. All right, so let's talk about that embedding ta embedded tailoring variable. Um, Billy mentioned already a little bit. Uh, we talked about it being assessed at weeks two, four, and eight. And this, like extend, you know, as soon as you hit the non-response trigger, you were re-randomized into the non-response arm. So non-response was defined as soon as weight loss was less than a half a pound on average per week. So as soon as you met that criteria at either two, four, or eight weeks, you were re-randomized as a non-responder. So in this trial, not everybody was re-randomized, right? So we, don't, we no longer have eight embedded interventions, we have four. Um, the first, it, they're all adaptive interventions. The first begins with an app, responders continue with the app, and non-responders add text messaging, so they get one mHealth component added. 
The second begins with the app. Responders continue with the app. Non-responders get the text messaging, so another mHealth component, but they also get one of the traditional um, approaches, in this case, coaching. And then there are two just like that that begin with coaching. Responders continue. Non-responders add text messaging, or responders continue, and non-responders add text messaging, and they add meal replacement, that platinum um, sort of package of the intervention. The primary aim here was about that non-feriority question, right? Is the app um, about the same in terms of outcomes compared to the app plus coaching when delivered as a stage one intervention? Remember, these stage one research questions are, are sort of housed within the context of an adaptive intervention. So knowing that something else is going to happen, what's the best way to begin? Secondary aims um, included the question about the non-responders. So what's the best augmentation tactic? Is mHealth, you know, additional mHealth alone okay, or do we need to add a, a traditional package? And then um, comparing the embedded adaptive interventions within the SMART, so comparison across those four embedded adaptive interventions, and then, of course, baseline and time-varying moderators is our type four examples. Okay. All right, last trial. We're switching gears completely in a couple different ways now. We're in education, hooray! And <laughs> we're talking about implementation, also good. And we're looking at school-based, uh, school-level outcomes instead of individual-level outcomes. So there's so a Emily, lot of differences going on here. So Emily, before you start, I just wanted to yeah. mention about the ROC analysis. Those of you who are interested, Ian, maybe we can put this on the, uh, maybe we can add this online. There's a guy that we wrote with uh, Eva Sess on how to use um, ROC analysis to identify tailoring variables and cut points uh, based on observational studies. So we can we can add that to the yeah reading list. Also, this is noting that we have to do the That's okay. I think we can go. <laughs> I think I think this is fine. Why don't you take another ten minutes? Yeah, and we'll we're changing the schedule a little bit a little because bit. I know some of you are tired. Um, but we can yeah. talk about this. Later. Take another ten minutes to wrap okay. up. Okay, yeah. we'll we'll walk through ASIC. So ASIC is school-based implementation yeah, of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and the PI is. Um, uh, Amy Kilborn, who's here at the University of Michigan, and this was done, A6 stands for Adaptive School-Based Implementation of CBT. It was done in combination with TRAILS. Do we have anyone from TRAILS this year? We did last year. No, not this year. Um, so combination with TRAILS. Population here is not uh, individual kids in the schools, but instead the school professionals. So we're talking about counselors, social workers, um, psychologists, nurses who are employed at Michigan high schools and might be delivering CBT in the school setting. And the outcome of interest is at the school level, which is the number of CBT sessions that were actually delivered at the school. And the rationale here is, again, kind of like RBT, where we're scaling up and scaling down using a toolkit of implementation science tools that we have. So the most basic tool we have is called REP, which is re re Replicating Effective Programs, which is the lowest level implementation strategy available. So think like one day didactic training, manual, maybe some phone support if you have questions, right? Very basic implementation. Um, probably enough for some. Probably some schools that that's not gonna be enough for to see change. And so then we could think about adding coaching, which is effective but we know it's expensive and burdensome, and you're starting to hear the synergy of these rationales, right? Heterogeneity, cost, burden, they're all in there. Um, that might work, probably not needed for everyone, which is good because we can't afford to deliver it to everyone. And then there's facilitation, which is another human component, but instead of addressing sort of the school professionals' skills in delivering CBT, it's, they're also there to help with sort of organizational problems that might be getting in the way of delivering CBT. My principal doesn't like it. There's no space to do it in the building. You name it, there's barriers that we can't do it, right? So this study was about trying to figure out how to maximally, optimally combine rep, the basics, with coaching and facilitation in ways that would produce the best outcomes in terms of the number of CBT sessions that were delivered. So two questions here. Rep as a first stage versus rep plus coaching. Do we need coaching right out the gate or can we get away with just the basic implementation strategy? Second question is about adding facilitation for those who need it, whether or not they had coaching. Okay. Here's our study design. 
you should read this paper. <laughs> There's a lot of complexity to this study design, one of which is there was a three-month run-in period before the first randomization. So everybody got rep, everybody got rep, had that opportunity for three months, and then they were randomized to either continue with rep or add coaching to rep. At month five, they were classified as either eligible for facilitation, and we'll talk about that definition in a second, or not eligible for facilitation. Those who were not eligible for facilitation continued with whatever they began with. Those who were eligible were randomized to either continue or to get facilitation in addition to what they were getting. Again, you can see how our randomizations line up with our research questions, right? Our first question is about how do we begin, rep or rep plus coaching, randomization. Second question is about for those who might need facilitation, do we add it or do we need it? First stage, Intervention options are rep or rep plus coaching. Notice that coaching is in-person coaching during CBT groups at the school for a minimum of 12 weeks. So it's a pretty intensive coaching uh, engagement. And facilitation is phone calls. So a little, it's not as in-person, but phone calls with somebody who's an expert in CBT who can address some of the skill questions if they have them, but is also skilled at sort of the strategic thinking around the organizational barriers that might be getting in the way. And then, um, yeah, so those are all the pieces. The tailored variable here was assessed at one time point, and it was assessed eight weeks after that first randomization, and it was based on two things. How many CBT sessions the school professional said they provided, and whether they reported barriers to CBT in their school setting. And so if the school professional didn't deliver three or more CBT components to 10 or more students, they were considered eligible for facilitation, sort of an assumption that maybe there's some other barriers at play here. Or if the average number of barriers reported were more than two. So sometimes there were more than one school professional in the school, which is why that's an average and not just the number. Four embedded interventions here, again, because we only randomize the non-responders or those who are el in eligible for facilitation, right? So rep continue for ineligible and continue for eligible. Is that adaptive or non-adaptive? Non-adaptive, right? It's rep all the way across for everybody, regardless of whether they're eligible. And then begin with rep, continue for ineligible, add facilitation for those who are eligible. And then again, we have non-adaptive rep plus coaching all the way through, regardless of eligibility, and then an adaptive intervention that adds facilitation for those who are eligible for it. Primary aim here is a type three. So they wanted to compare always rep, the red non-adaptive rep for everybody, to the adaptive intervention that starts with rep plus coaching and continues that for those who are ineligible, but adds facilitation if it's needed. So again, we see kind of like RBT, where we saw the primary aim was a comparison of two embedded non-adaptive interventions. Here, it's, a, it's again a comparison of two interventions within the trial. One is non-adaptive and one is adaptive. Secondary aims are baseline and time-varying moderators, and then comparing the adaptive interventions, but instead of looking at the number of CBT sessions delivered at the school level, looking at cost effectiveness, which we know is an important outcome when it comes to implementation research. Okay. I think maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, let's stop yeah. there. I, I only want to say one thing about that study. Can you go back a slide? Yes. Yeah. 61. So um, this is different from everything you saw before in the sense that this was a comparison of the Cadillac adaptive intervention. Do you guys see that? D and F is yeah. the most expensive adaptive intervention. Do you guys see that? because it uses coaching, rep, and facilitation, versus usual care, which is just rep, which is just train everyone and give them your phone number, right? So what's cool about this study, one of the things that's cool, is the primary aim was a Cadillac adaptive intervention versus usual care. Isn't that groovy? The other thing I don't even say, and then I'll let you guys go, because Mason has something he wants to share with you guys, <laughs> is these is the first time you guys see a cluster smart. Okay, all of these randomizations are at the school level, but every school has, on average, 
one to four school professionals who they are the ones we want delivering CPT, so the outcome is nested. So this is, uh, at the time this was funded, there was only one other clustered random, clustered yeah. smart, and now there's a few more, but it was unique in that. Okay, I'll stop there. Mason, everybody talk it up, everybody.